Hi. Um, in this video, we're going to I'm going to quickly show you how you can uh, solve the unwinding string problem by energy methods. And um, this is a problem that we've we've solved in class before, uh, where a string unwinds from a wheel, and uh, after the string after the the string is unwound, the uh, the task is to figure out what's the velocity of the wheel. And it's much much easier to um, solve this using an energy method. Um, so let me draw the start by drawing the system here. We had a um, we start off with a with a basically a, a hoop or a rim that has a certain radius to it, which we call R. And the assumption that we make in this problem is that the mass is it's a very thin hoop, and the mass is essentially concentrated around. The, the radius R, and we don't worry about the thickness of that, we just say it's a very, very thin hoop, so all the mass is out here. And so the mass of the, uh, of the, the wheel is some value, and all that mass is spread out that way. Okay, uh, then what we did is we said let's wrap a string around this and have the string come off and be attached to a cylinder and that mass would be MC, mass of the cylinder. And of course, uh, this is going to uh, accelerate. And as it accelerates, it's going to cause the wheel to also uh, rotate faster and faster. Okay. Uh, so we're assuming that the wheel is is rotating around an axis that passes through its center. Um, and in the real world, we would have spokes here to connect it. Right? and the mass of those spokes is very small. Okay, so when we solve this by Newton's laws, just as a reminder, <laughs> actually the second law, we, it was complicated and we actually had to do, um, for the wheel, we had to do torque is equal to I times alpha. That gave us one equation. And then we had to look at the cylinder, and we had to write F is equal to M cylinder times A, and that was for the cylinder. And that gave us basically a system of equations, and um, we had to recognize that alpha and A are related to each other. Remember that acceleration is just R times alpha, and so then we had that. We had tension going on. There was a string with tension, which caused the torque and tension was part of the forces that acted on the cylinder. So we had a whole system of equations to solve, and it, it took a little bit of algebra to get that done. So let's try this now by an energy approach. And um, let's assume that we have conservation of mechanical forms of energy, okay, in which we do. So our system is going to include the mass and the wheel and the earth, and we're going to assume that friction is pretty small. So if we can make that assumption, then any changes in potential energy plus any changes in kinetic energy should be adding up to zero. Okay? So if there's a if there's a decrease in potential energy, which is going to be the case here, then there should be a corresponding increase in kinetic energy. So this usually leads us to something like this, where it says potential initial plus kinetic initial is equal to potential final plus kinetic final. Okay, so separating out those terms. Um, and the difference now in this problem is that the kinetic actually has two components. There's going to be a translational component. Okay, we're going to have a K trans. Then that's going to go with the cylinder, which is falling straight down. And we're also going to have a K rotational, which has to do with the wheel's kinetic energy when it's rotating. And those two terms are going to come over here under the final term. Um, the initially, nothing is moving, so this, of course, is zero. And all of the energy will be potential. And finally, the potential will be zero, because that's going to be the mass that's falling but we're going to have kinetic energy to, w to worry about, and that's going to be K trans final 
and K rotational final. So, we got a couple of easy zeros in there, but then we're going to have to evaluate potential energy before the mass falls, and then kinetic energies after things are moving. Okay. Uh, let's w add one thing to my picture here, which I did not add yet, which is the fact that the mass is going to fall a height h. Okay. So from here to here, it's going to drop that distance. And let's make this our reference for gravitational potential energy. So if, the, if this is our reference level, then the mass has zero potential energy here. That means it clearly has non-zero potential energy up there. And that would be equal to the mass of the cylinder times g times h. So all of the energy in the system initially is coming from this elevated mass. And that's equal to mc times g times h. Uh, how about for the translational energies at the end? Well, the falling mass will have translational kinetic energy equal to one half times the mass of the cylinder times its final velocity squared. It's a linear velocity. That's the velocity that it has just before it impacts the ground. And we also have a rotational energy from the wheel, which will be one half times i times omega final squared. Okay, and this is the first time we've actually included this term in kinetic energy, but that's how you do it. Because now you've got two types of kinetic energy, one from the cylinder, one from the rotating wheel. All right, now, our goal, at this point we have to decide what do we really want. And let's just say that we want to find omega final, because I think that's what we calculated before. So you can calculate lots of things here. You could find the final velocity, like the final tangential velocity, you could find the final angular velocity, you could find alpha, but let's do what we did before, which was to find the final angular velocity of the wheel. Then we can compare to see if we did this right. So what I'm going to do is copy this down then, mc times g times h equals, and then I'll write this first term, one half times the mass of the cylinder, but instead of writing v final squared, I'm going to write r times omega final squared. So I'm substituting Oops, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, for, I need to put the square on the outside here. So I'm substituting for V final, and I'm writing R times omega final, because that's a tangential velocity, and the tangential velocity of the wheel at this point will be equal to the falling final velocity of the mass, okay, just before it hits the ground. So that's an important substitution there. And the rest of this, we can keep the same. Oh, maybe for I, uh, this is a hoop. So that's going to be the mass of the wheel times R squared times omega final squared. So now I have to use the fact that a hoop has that particular rotational inertia. Um, right. And then we've got what we've got. Uh, now, stuff should be going away here some of it, and we're going to have to do some grouping. We're trying to get the omegas, and we can probably factor them out here. It looks like we're going to be factoring out an r squared omega final squared. Um, we're also factoring out a one half, I think, and that's going to leave us with the mass of the cylinder plus the mass of the wheel. That's nice. And that's equal to the mass of the cylinder times g times h. And now we just have, you know, the almost trivial steps of just getting things on the other side and solving for what we want. And so we're going to multiply both sides by 2. So it'll be 2 times the mass of the cylinder times g times h. We're going to divide both sides by r squared. And we're going to divide both sides by the sum mc plus m wheel. And that's equal to omega final squared. And the last step is to take the square root. When we do that, you can take out the r squared as 1 over r. But everything else still has to be inside the radical.
And that expression is exactly the same expression that we obtained using um, the combination of Newton's second law for the, uh, the wheel and the cylinder. Okay. Uh, this method is a lot faster. I know I still used a lot of ink on it, but if you really consider just starting at this point and working your way down, it really took three lines of math to come up with this result, and we didn't have a system of equations to solve. So using energy methods is usually a simpler way of approaching problems, if you can, rather than using Newton's laws. Um, know how to do them both, but the energy method is oftentimes going to cost you less ink when you're solving the problem. Um, I'll also point out that you could have, in this problem, instead of finding the final angular velocity, you could easily also find the final velo linear velocity of the mass by, by doing a different substitution here, by leaving the V final here and making omega into V over R. You could also easily find alpha and probably other things too. But um, the point is, is that the energy method is a pretty, pretty compact way of coming, getting those things, uh, usually just with a single equation. Okay, so hopefully that helps you with some of the problems that you are working on. Best of luck to you.